honestly, if Agent Dove had been armed with the 10 millimeter pistol that the FBI eventually wound up issuing after the fight, there's a 50-50 chance that it may not have made any difference because he may have wound up running out of ammunition before he ever got a chance to fire the shot that hit the suspect as he crawled out of the vehicle. Because Agent Dove expended two magazines worth of ammunition in his 9mm pistol, and he was on the tail end of his second uh, magazine when he was finally able to land that shot on the suspect as he climbed out of the car. So if he'd have had his 10 millimeter or the 45 or whatever gun that somebody wanted him to be able to have at that moment in time, it's likely that he would have been already out of ammunition by the time that the suspect crawled out of the car. Welcome back to the Firearms Nation podcast. This month, I hit my 20th year in law enforcement. And there are several instances in law enforcement, historically, that always struck a chord with me. One of them that I've talked about before on the show, and I brought in an author of an officer who was part of that incident with the North Hollywood shootout. A very, very sad day in law enforcement, but also changed the course of law enforcement. You know, because of that, rifles became something that most law enforcement officers did not have, and now they do. Two other incidents also affected law enforcement, and we're coming up on their anniversaries. And I wanted to bring on someone who has extensive knowledge about those incidents. The first incident was the New Hall shooting, and that was in California, and uh, several officers were killed, and because of that, it affected the training community. I was a law enforcement trainer and we'd always bring up this instance. And in fact, I heard about this when I was in the academy. Uh, some of the information is wrong, which I know, I, I think Mike mentioned that before, but uh, a lot of it is correct. And then the other one that was very dramatic was the FBI Miami shootout. That changed uh, calibers for a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies because they felt that the current caliber that the FBI was using at the time was inefficient. And of course, now everything has come full circle. But both those anniversaries are coming up in a couple of weeks, and I wanted to bring on Mike Wood, who is uh, the resident Firearms Nation historian. And he's been on this podcast several times before, bringing comparisons between what was going on in the 60s and 70s in law enforcement and society to, to comparing it to what's going on today. And it, it is very similar. It's funny how life is secular. So without further ado, let me bring on Mike Wood. Mike, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Arik. It's always great to be with you and the audience here at the Firearms Nation. Love it. Well, thank you. And I know, you know, people don't know, or some do, that you're you're very big in revolvers. I mean, you actually have a website <laughs> called The Revolver Guy. Yes. And I I think you and Jerry Micklick are the two people that single handedly uh keep revolvers in <laughs> people's consciousness. Uh, and the, but you know, I, I was looking through your website. I mean you're you're posting all the time with that. And I know you went to Shot Show. Uh so before we get started, I first want to say uh a lot of people are excited to actually see who Mike Wood is. <laughs> hope I You're... didn't disappoint anybody here. This is what you got. <laughs> yeah, guys, don't don't tune out just yet. Uh, <laughs> we haven't gotten to the, the good stuff yet. Um, but you are, there's several people who are constantly requested uh, through email, through private chat to bring back on, and, and you're, you're in the top three. Uh, people love history. And, uh, uh, I'm honored. So I'm Thanks, cool. guys. <laughs> All those bribes and, are working, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and, and you know, guys, uh, he does have a book out currently, and then I know he's working uh, on a new book. So uh, just remember that when all the new history buffs, that you know, when the book comes out, uh, you know, to go out and get it. And it's funny because I I totally forgot when, just because life and all this COVID and the craziness, you know, I I didn't get a chance to uh, uh, listen 
to our previous ones, but I remember you were talking about the FBI shootout as going to be your upcoming book. So I'm glad that that's what we're talking about today. Yes, absolutely. Glad, glad to get a chance to talk to you all about it today. Uh, before we get started on that, you you went to SHOT Show, your revolver guy. Was there anything, I know we're almost four months away <laughs> from what SHOT Show was, but I didn't get a chance to talk to you. And I definitely d didn't bring up revolvers and anything. Uh, was there anything in revolver side that is new and revolutionary? No pun intended. Well, I think... I think one of the the things from a technological standpoint that you guys might be most interested in is the uh, the push from Taurus this year to put uh, red dot optics on their revolvers. Uh, they've actually machined uh, rails integral to the frame so that you could mount uh, a red dot on top of. They've got two different models. They have a, a, a 605 and an 856 uh, revolver that they're they're placing the dots on, and so that's that's kind of neat, uh, kind of new. Uh, kind of a blend of the old and the new, if you will. Uh, we've seen other aftermarket uh, companies that have put rails together so that you could mount dots and so forth on your revolvers, but this is really the first time that we've seen it come from the factory like that. So um, that's kind of a neat direction to take uh, uh, a technology that uh, had grown stale in certain ways and to kind of bring it into uh, the modern era with the, the ability to use the uh, the optics that that it give us better sighting and uh, more rapid target acquisitions and things like that. So that was kind of a neat thing from a technical side. It, obviously, I was going to ask a question, but I think I might know the answer. But the, is there that much of a demand for revolvers that they're actually now starting to throw red dots on revolvers? I don't know. It might be kind of a bit of the chicken or the egg thing, you know. Uh, putting a red dot on these revolvers might actually increase demand for them, uh, but I think we're seeing definitely a revolver renaissance in the last, call it three, four years. Uh, a very heightened increase in the interest in them, uh, and I think an appreciation for what they can bring. Obviously, uh, you know, if you're going to do the whole revolver versus auto pistol argument, there are pros and cons for each system. But I think, uh, particularly with the growth of the shooting community in the last couple of years where we've had, you know, millions of people buying their, their very first gun. Um, and we've also have a, a bit of a maturity of that group of people that came into the industry perhaps 10 or 15 years ago and all they knew were Glocks and ARs and now they're kind of getting bored with them and they're looking for something else that's interesting and they're suddenly discovering these revolvers. And so I think kind of that introduction of new shooters and uh, shooters that have been in the industry for a little bit or looking for something a little different, those two themes kind of combined and, and we're seeing a dramatic increase in revolver interest. Uh, we're seeing classes cropping up uh, all over the U.S. that are revolver specific. Uh, we're seeing a lot more traffic on sites like mine at Revolver Guy and uh, the formation of other groups and, and uh, Facebook groups and so forth that are dedicated to revolvers and so I, I think there's just a, a renewed interest in them, which is neat. And the manufacturer's been responding. Um, they've been bringing back a lot of new designs, uh, recreating a lot of uh, older designs uh, and using new methods. And uh, so we're seeing a good response from the manufacturers. You know, Colt is back in the revolver game with a bunch of exciting revolvers. Um, we're seeing some, some pretty creative and clever things that are being done. Uh, Kimber. You know, the 1911 maker, they're making revolvers now. And so, um, yeah, I think there's there's been a good response from the industry as well. You know, one of the things people like revolvers for, and I'm sure you'll tell me if I'm wrong, but people have the perception that they're more reliable than a semi-auto, less prone to jam. I, I, I'm I sure that's correct, uh, but I'll also tell you this. Yeah, oh, okay, well, you can, you can... We could argue it. You we know. could argue that. It's honestly, I mean, we have this discussion a lot and I've talked about it on Revolver Guy too, but, you know, revolvers are, are relatively simple to operate. So there are less things that can go wrong just from that perspective, but revolvers are very capable of malfunctioning just like an auto pistol. And when a revolver malfunctions, lots of times it's for reasons that you can't fix as easily as you can with a, with a semi-automatic pistol. 
Uh, you know, there's not a lot of remedial action that you can do for a revolver when, when things go wrong with that. And so, um, you know, they're, they're simpler to operate. I think, I think for, uh, I think they're less, they're less tolerant of abuse. A revolver is certainly less tolerant of abuse. It's a, it's a more delicate mechanism. It's more finely fitted. There's more moving parts. So if you're the type of person that, uh, you know, treats your revolver like, uh, uh, you know, uh, your lawnmower, then that's probably not a, a real great choice for you. Um, you know, your Glock is going to be a lot more tolerant of, uh, of just normal abuse and so forth. But, um, I think neglect, uh, revolver is a lot more tolerant of neglect. You know, it, it's not sensitive to things like lubrication and being as clean and so forth as, as some of the semi-auto pistols are. And, uh, so, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to it. Well, I will say, uh, when I when I did my Smith and Wesson MMP armors course, uh, the instructor showed us images of the revolver course, and that you have this bag full of hundreds of parts that you've got to put together. And I was like, yeah, yeah, because people were complaining that you know the MMP was tough, and they said, no, 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 <laughs> that's not. <laughs> you tough. haven't seen tough yet. <laughs> and I think that kind of kept me from wanting to get that certificate. Well, we'll try opening up a Colt. You know, and you'll see this mismatch of parts that were done by some demented wizard. You know, and uh, so it's it's uh, it's they're they're interesting, they're fun. I enjoy them. Um, a revolver can do some things that an auto just can't, and vice versa. And and so they're complementary to each other. I I never would um, make a point that one could replace the other. You know, they're very complementary, and uh, you pick the right tool for the right job. So. And which which one do you carry? Both. Both. Yeah, yeah. I carry both. Uh, I carry an, an auto pistol uh, as well as a revolver because, again, uh, there are some things that each of them uh, can do that the other can't. Um, I can carry the revolver in places and in certain methods that I just couldn't carry a suitable auto pistol. When I when I start getting to the point where uh, discretion and concealment is a higher priority, um, then the revolver gets the nod because a, a good, uh, J frame can go places that an auto pistol simply can't. Uh, and if I did shrink an auto pistol down to the size where I could get away with it, then I start running into reliability issues and, uh, operational issues with it that, uh, sacrifice the, the advantage. And so, um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, if I had the choice to uh, start a fight with 15 rounds in my hand versus five, I'd much rather start with 15. So, uh, you know, it's again, it's it's time and place. And, um, you know, Pat Rogers used to say that the mission drives the gear train. And that's very much the case uh, with these with these firearms here. So. And we adjust our tactics. You know, yes. I. I I wrote recently, uh, for the guys that might be interested, I wrote recently an article at Revolver Guy about what I call the snub mindset. And we have to accept the fact that when we're carrying equipment that has certain limitations, then we have to change our approach to things. The way we think about things, the tactics that we use, things that we pay attention to, the things we try to avoid, uh, those all become much more important considerations when you're working with equipment that might be limiting to you in some way. You go to the movies a lot when you watch movies? No, I don't. I don't. I don't go to, to the movies a whole lot these days. Uh, but uh, go ahead. You're probably going to lead me into something here. No, well, I just... Uh, so I know the, the John Wick fans are excited. I'm excited too. The new one's coming out. But I recall in John Wick 3, he's being chased by these guys and he goes into some historical or like art place or I don't know what it was. But he had all these knives and stuff, but he starts off like he, he barricades the door and they're trying to get in and he, he's putting together uh, a revolver. I don't know if you've ever seen that scene. Did, I have did not. You get, I'll have to uh, send it to you so you can see it. Um, obviously, they had some coaching, whatever, uh, but, you know, the, the, the revolver in, in movies, to me, it's always been there's some iconic westerns that had some, some great revolvers in it. Uh, and then, of course, you know, sadly, we had an incident on a Western recently or a year or so ago where someone was using a revolver and uh, somebody got shot. 
uh, yeah. which it's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, the revolver, it, it's one of these interesting things. I, I do have a revolver, uh, like you said, there's some, it, it can conceal very, very well. And, uh, if, yeah, so not to get into too much of that, but it, it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, if I need a, a pocket or an ankle type gun, that's, that's what I'm going to. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, it's, and it's a lifestyle thing for a lot of people. You know, there's a lot of people that can't go to work wearing a a Glock 19 and a and a bunch of magazines on their belt and so forth because if they get caught, they get fired and um, or they get socially ostracized, even if it's legal. And so, for people in those types of situations where deep concealment is a priority, um, then that's a place where something like a revolver really shines. You know, it gives you a very reliable, very powerful, very capable option that is also very easily concealed. And, uh, so there are just a bunch of different niches where the revolver really works better than anything else. And so that's why it gets used and that's why it still lives. I mean, that's why we're still seeing such interest in these guns all these years later. So speaking of revolvers, uh, mm -hmm. one of the, the incidents I want to talk about, the, the Newhall shooting, and, and your book was uh, Newhall shooting, a tactical analysis, survival yes. lessons from one of law enforcement's deadly, deadliest shootings. In that shooting, we'll, we'll go into it, and but I, I, I want to address the fact that what I had been taught in in the academy was that the, the officers were, uh, they found brass in their pockets because they were picking up the brass after they shot it and, and emptied it. Uh, and they, that's why they were trying to teach us about subconscious, whether they use that word or not, but the subconscious skill set. Like if you do something over and over again, chances are under stress, you're going to do it again. So uh, just go into what the New Hall, because a lot of people on the show, not tactical people at all, but what is the New Hall incident and, and what can we learn from it? Well, the nutshell of it is that on the uh, the evening of, of 6 April 1970, actually the very early morning hours, just after midnight, um, four highway patrolmen uh, were engaged with two very violent felons and a car stop that went bad. And those two violent felons killed the four officers. Uh, these officers were all very young, very inexperienced officers. They made a series of tactical mistakes in dealing with these bad guys, and they were killed. And... Uh, Unfortunately, the two bad guys got away initially. Uh, one was later captured and uh, one later committed suicide at the, at the secondary crime scene. Um, but uh, the shooting really rocked the California Highway Patrol and law enforcement in general. And it really spurred what was starting to become the, the officer survival movement, as we coined it, from the late 1960s, early 1970s. And this was really the shot in the arm that really energized that whole movement for uh, an increase in a focus on officer safety, tactics, equipment, policies, procedures, how we go about doing things. Um, this particular incident gave birth to what officers today would recognize as their high risk or their felony vehicle stop tactics. Um, you know, a lot of those things were the direct uh, result of the, the new hall gunfight. Um, and then we also saw a lot of different things with respect to equipment. And one of the things that you're hinting at here uh, regards one of the officers in the gunfight, uh, Officer James Pence, who was killed while he was attempting to reload his revolver in the middle of the fight. And as the legend goes, he uh, emptied the, the spent brass from his revolver cylinder into his hand and he thrust his hand into his pocket and he put the, the spent brass in his pocket because he'd been trained to do that during his, his training as a, as a cadet at the academy and that under stress that he performed that same action. And the thought was at the time that the delay that he took in pocketing his spent brass was just enough time to allow the bad guy to creep up on him and, and execute him with a close range gunshot while he was just finishing the reload. And that if he had just dumped his brass on the ground, he would have completed his reload quicker and would have been back in the fight with a loaded gun before the bad guy crept up on him. 
And that's an interesting story, and uh, there are some valuable lessons that are hidden in it about training scars, but my research into the Newhall gunfight showed that uh, it actually didn't happen that way. There have been gunfights where, where officers pocketed spent brass reflexively as a result of training, but it didn't happen at Newhall. And Officer Pence actually did eject his spent brass on the ground, and he was struggling to reload his revolver uh, for several reasons. Number one, because he was using a very inefficient loading system. At the time, the Highway Patrol mandated that their officers would carry their ammunition in, in what we call a dump pouch. And it's just simply a flapped leather pouch that you stick six loose rounds into. And when you pop the snap on the pouch, it dumps six loose rounds into your hand and they spill out into your hand and all over the ground, usually, when you use those things. And so he was having to load individual rounds into the chambers of his revolver. And under stress, uh, that's a very difficult thing to do. And Officer Pence had already been very, very badly wounded at this point and was... Uh, being uh, shot at and wounded actively while he was in the process of trying to reload this revolver. And so between the injuries and the stress and so forth, he just struggled to get that done and unfortunately ran out of time before uh, the felon came up and snuck up, sneaked up on his position and, and executed him. Um, so, but that's one of those enduring myths from that gunfight that kind of took on legs. And even the California Highway Patrol was teaching its own officers that that's how it went down for many, many years. And so, um, it kind of grew to a legendary status and you know, how, how training works, right? Your instructor tells you something and then 10 years later, you're an instructor and you tell your student the same thing because your instructor told it to you. And, and those things kind of take on a life of their own. And so here we are 50 plus years down the road from that gunfight and we're still trying to bust the myth that brass was pocketed in, you know, James Pence's pockets there. Uh, it didn't happen, but that doesn't make it, um, uh, that, that doesn't mean that it's not useful as a lesson though about training scars because the general underlying theme of it is very important that you will fight like you train and under stress, you will do things that you're habituated to do as a result of your training. So we need to make sure that we're doing the right things when we're training and that we're building the good habits that we want people to have so that when the chips are down, that they're doing the right things. So in this incident, the, these guys that were stopped, did, were, did they, can't remember, were, were they involved in a robbery or did they, they, they had just yeah. done something it was a robbery and they were, they were driving up on, was it the Pacific Coast Highway? Was that right? Yeah, the way the way it went down, these guys were these guys were felons that met each other in jail. Um, they had each been serving time for, uh, for murders that they had committed and bank robberies that they had committed. They met each other in jail and when they were paroled, they hatched a plan to commit more robberies together. They were going to rob armored cars and they were going to rob banks together. And so... Uh, the night uh, in question where uh, the shooting happened, uh, they were returning from a combination scouting party and training day. Uh, they had gone into the hills uh, north of Los Angeles to shoot a bunch of firearms that they had to maintain their proficiency and to check the weapons out. They were also using some walkie-talkies uh, that they had purchased for uh, the purpose of communicating during their, their robberies. And they were, they were testing these walkie-talkies and seeing what kind of range that they could get. And uh, so they were driving home from this training day, and uh, some hapless citizen happened to get cut off by these guys. And essentially a road rage incident occurred where the citizen motioned to uh, the driver that, you know, he wanted him to pull over so he can give him a piece of his mind. And when the, the bad guy pulled over, he pulled a gun out and pointed it at the citizen. The citizen was uh, fortunately smart enough to be able to talk his way out of the incident and run away. And he immediately reported it to the highway patrol. The man had pointed a gun at him. And so the highway patrol went looking for this vehicle. And uh, they, they located the vehicle uh, and, and pulled it over. And the rest is, is sad history for us. Um, so that's kind of how the whole thing kicked off. Um, had it not been for the citizen getting involved with a, a road rage incident with these guys, they might have gone on their way and been able to uh, carry out their plans to rob banks and armored cars and 
there probably would have been a confrontation later, but it wouldn't have happened that night. So the initial, uh, was it a two-man unit for the highway patrol? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so what happened is when our, when our bad guy uh, got involved with the road range incident, he had, he was traveling alone. His partner had been dropped off in the hills for the purpose of testing the, the walkie talkies. And so when the road rage incident occurred, uh, the one felon, uh, was driving the vehicle, got involved with the road rage, pointed the gun at the motorist. And after that motorist, uh, took off, uh, our bad guy went and picked up his partner. And so now the two bad guys were in the car and they were simply going to drive home to their apartment in Long Beach, California and, uh, call it a night. But in the meantime, the highway patrol started looking for him and a two man unit pulled in behind them and started to follow them. And they hatched a plan with another highway patrol unit that they would, uh, just follow this guy, but would not attempt to stop him until the pair of vehicles passed the location that the second highway patrol unit was staged at further down the road. And then when there were two highway patrol vehicles, four officers total, they would attempt to stop the car. But what happened is prior to reaching the point where that second highway patrol vehicle was stationed, uh, the two felons in the car got nervous. They realized they were being tailed and they pulled off the highway into the parking lot of an all night diner and a gas station. And they preempted the, uh, the fight. And as the second highway patrol vehicle tried to respond to the location where they had stopped, uh, the gunfight erupted. Uh, the two officers made a, a tactically poor approach to the vehicle. Uh, they were both shot and killed. And as the second officer was falling, that's when the second backup highway patrol vehicle arrived with, with two other officers. And they got involved into an extended gunfight that lasted several minutes with, with these two felons. And both those officers were killed in, in that resulting gunfight. So what, what was the weaponry that uh, the bad guys used? They had a trunk full of vehicles, uh, or a, a, rather a, a vehicle full of guns, excuse me. Um, and because they had been out target shooting, they had a whole bunch of loaded weapons that were available in the back seat of the car. And their primary armament uh, involved, uh, for one felon, shooting uh, two different 1911 pistols. Uh, the other felon uh, fired uh, a, a 38 caliber revolver and a pump shotgun. And uh, both of the felons wound up uh, collecting weapons from the downed officers as well. And uh, they, they, they collected them and, and used them to effect as well later in the fight. So, but it was a mix of, mix of handguns and the one long gun that was being used was a, was a pump shotgun. It was a, a, an off-brand version of a Mossberg 500, basically a Western field. So, and, and they used them very effectively. Um, the, uh, the thing that, uh, that really won the fight for these two bad guys was their aggression and their maneuver. Uh, they were constantly moving throughout the battle space. They flanked the officers. When the officers hunkered down in positions of cover, uh, the felons would flank their positions and fire at them from the flanks, aggressively charge them uh, using, uh, you know, in one case, the shotgun to provide uh, a lot of um, fire down range to, uh, to get the officers to hunker down as they maneuvered to, uh, to sneak up on them and assault them. Uh, the one officer with the 1911 pistol, or the one felon rather, with the 1911 pistol did the same. Uh, did a lot of maneuver with it, uh, laid down a bunch of cover fire with the pistol, and then snuck up on the position where he was able to execute, to, you know, the remaining officer. And so the felons were um, aggressive. Uh, they used good tactics, and uh, they had a, a superiority of firepower in that every time that one of their weapons went dry, they simply picked another one up off the ground or up off of uh, their vehicle and continued fighting. So those were all factors that were important in the way that this fight played out for the officers that were involved. But the big lesson for law enforcement following this was that poor decisions that are made from the standpoint of tactics lead to very poor results. And we need to use better tactics and we need to uh, obviously change some things about our equipment. 
but uh, but the tactics really were the most important result of this. Um, we talked about the high risk vehicle stop procedures, the felony stop vehicle procedures that resulted from it. And you know, if those types of tactics had been used by these officers, they still could have won the day, even though they didn't have as many firearms as the felons did, even though they didn't use um, you know uh, uh, semi-automatic pistols and so forth. They could have won the day with better tactics. Uh, using the equipment that they had, but it was their poor tactical decisions that really got them into into the mess that they were in. Sure. And we see that, that a lot, right? So, and and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the one point that I'll make is that following Newhall, and we see this all the time, even today, following Newhall, there was a push to blame the the equipment deficiencies. Uh, to blame the results on the equipment deficiencies that the officers had. Uh, the refrain was, well, you know, if they'd had speed loaders or if they'd had semi-auto pistols or if they had better equipment, they would have won the day. And the reason that we see this type of focus on equipment following these events is that it's very easy for us to make changes in equipment, right? When things go bad and you have a horrific result and officers die, it's real easy to go out and buy a new widget or to issue a new pistol, or to issue a new caliber, it's a lot harder to change things like department culture, tactics, uh, mindset, and those types of things. And so we pick the low-hanging fruit where we, we say, ah, it's, it was the equipment's fault, and we'll fix that, we'll write a check for it, and we're done, and we don't have to deal with it anymore as police administrators or as police trainers. And and that, unfortunately, is a trend that we'll see in the layer event that we talk about with Miami as well. And, and we could point our finger at any number of events today where that still continues to happen, where we have bad results that are often the results of bad tactics, bad decision making. And we wind up looking at equipment issues as an easy fix, as an easy solution, because doing the heavy lifting of working on the mindset, the tactics, the department culture, that's, that's a lot more difficult. So I was just going to ask, uh, one of them commits suicide, but the other one, he, he was uh, taken down uh, by how many officers and at what time frame from the killings? Well, the, 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 this, this particular felon fled the scene uh, through a river wash that was adjacent to the, the shooting location, and he attempted to carjack a, uh, a citizen who was uh, camping out in the desert in uh, a pickup truck that had kind of a homemade camper shell on the back. And uh, he, he threatened the, to kill the citizen if he didn't give him the keys to the vehicle. That citizen had a, uh, an old uh, Webley revolver, 38 Smith & Wesson revolver, a very low-powered uh, revolver, and he fired through the, the plywood walls of his homemade camper shell from inside the, the camper shell at the bad guy outside uh, and as a, an attempt to scare him away. And the bad guy fired one shot, which was all he had left in his revolver at the time, and uh, managed to get this citizen to come out of his vehicle. And he clubbed him and almost unconscious with the, uh, with the empty revolver, uh, pistol whipped him and took his vehicle. And he was driving away from that location in the carjacked vehicle when he was stopped at a roadblock that had been set up by sheriff's deputies from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. And so they arrested him there at the at the roadblock. And they they put two and two together pretty quick and realized that they had the guy that had fled the scene from the uh, from the highway patrol shooting. So the the other incident that has an anniversary on April 11th uh, is the one you just referenced, the Miami FBI shootout, yeah. which, uh, again, uh, lots to, to unbox on that one. So let's get into uh, uh, what was the, the shootout and, and the little backstory behind it. Okay. Some similarities with Newhall in many ways. Um, when we start looking at the bad guys in this event, uh, they were bank and armored car robbers once again. And they had met each other in the military. Um, both of them were uh, stationed together at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky when they were in the Army. 
and were both prior service. One of them had been a Marine for a while, then went into the Army for a second enlistment. The other had spent his, his military career in the Army. But uh, when they were stationed together at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, they started to get together, and they were committing robberies of uh, local um, drug dealers. And they were taking them off for, uh, for the cash that they had on hand and so forth. And when they got out of the Army, um, they, uh, they elevated their game to robbing banks and robbing armored cars. And they did this primarily throughout the, uh, uh, the greater Miami area uh, of Florida, uh, Dade County down there. And their tactics that they used to strike these banks, to strike these armored cars, um, were very efficient. Uh, they were very organized. They were uh, using uh, action and, uh, you know, violence of action, uh, surprise, uh, heavy weapons. Uh, they were using um, center fire caliber rifles, um, 12 gauge shotguns, uh, magnum revolvers. And uh, their, their tactics grew more and more violent over time, um, where they were starting to shoot preemptively at armored car guards and, uh, and, and shoot and injure them. Um, and over time, they became more and more violent, and they caught the attention of the FBI's um, case squad that worked uh, the violent felons and the, the armored car and the bank robberies in that area. And so the FBI knew that these guys were on the loose. They didn't know who they were. They were trying to piece together the clues to identify who they were, where they could stop them, and um, it was a bit of a cat and mouse game. And these two felons that were robbing banks and armored cars and so forth were procuring some of their weapons and some of the vehicles that they were using in these robberies by going out to a popular shooting range that was a, uh, an impromptu shooting range location that was in the Everglades. Um, just kind of a rock pit that all the locals would go to to shoot their firearms and so forth for target practice. And what they did is they would sneak out there and they would ambush people that were target shooting and they would kill them for their weapons and for their, for their vehicle. And uh, some very good detective work was done by uh, members of the FBI and um, they had also some, some good hunches and some good luck that they, they were acting on. And they thought that uh, the latest uh, attempted murder of one of these shooting range victims out there might be connected to this this group of bank robbers. Um, and the victim in this latest case had been left for dead, but he had a fighting spirit and a will to survive, and he, he crawled out uh, a mile or so to the road and um, managed to survive being shot in the head uh, by uh, these bad guys who had left him for dead. And so when he was able to, uh, to finally speak with police and everything, and they were able to realize what vehicle uh, had been taken, and he was able to identify um, some details about the suspects, uh, then the FBI started to understand the connection between these, these rock pit murders and, and these violent felons that were robbing all these banks and armored cars. And that provided really uh, a usable lead for them. They, they now had a vehicle that they could look for. And um, between the pattern of activity that these robbers had and the, the known vehicle, and they figured that there was a pretty good chance that they might strike uh, a bank within a certain radius of their previous uh, bank robberies uh, on a range of days. And so the FBI set out to, to actually just uh, do a stakeout of a very large area. It was a rolling stakeout that covered uh, many miles uh, of U.S. Highway 1 as it, as it snakes through uh, the greater Miami area. And uh, it was just kind of a Hail Mary, to be honest. They were putting a lot of agents out there. They were going to look for the car, and they were going to hope that they could just stumble across these guys at some point. But the chances of finding them were relatively low. They knew they were casting a wide net and that there were lots of holes in it. And so mentally, they didn't really expect to find these guys, but they felt like they needed to, to make an attempt. And as things turned out, they stumbled right across them. 
the bad guys drove into one of the parking lots that agents had just set up at. Um, the, for whatever reason, they, they drove out of the parking lot. We're not sure if it's because they identified the FBI agents uh, in that parking lot. But the, the bad guys left the parking lot driving the vehicle that the FBI was looking for. And a pair of agents followed them and uh, verified that that was the right vehicle. And before long, you had a parade of FBI agents that were following that suspect vehicle uh, in an attempt to, uh, to, to take them down. And uh, those suspects drove away from the FBI, tried to chase, uh, tried to, to shake them by making a series of uh, turns that were intended to clearly identify that they were being followed and to try to shake anybody that was following them. And when it became clear that they were being followed by some type of police agency, um, then they made the attempt to escape. And uh, the FBI agents decided that the time and place was right for them to uh, try to ram their vehicle off the side of the road to terminate the pursuit. And a uh, gunfight resulted after the vehicle collision that, that disabled all the vehicles. So, a lot, lot's going on there. Uh, time frame, what, what year was this? 1986. 1986, okay. And this was April 11th of 1986. Uh, the two guys that were committing the robbery, they were going into the robbery, they were armed with long guns yeah they had um, one of the one of the individuals had a mini 14 uh, one of the individuals had a, uh, a collapsing stock folding stock uh, Smith and Wesson pump shotgun 12 gauge each of them were armed also with a 357 magnum revolver FBI at the time they were using uh, what type of they were using semi-autos which, which semi-auto were they using yeah, there, there was actually a mix of weapons. So the, the basic issue for FBI agents at the time was still a uh, revolver that was shooting um, 38 caliber uh, plus P ammunition. That was the basic weapon for agents at the time. If you were a SWAT qualified officer, or SWAT qualified agent rather, um, then you were authorized to carry a 9mm uh, Smith & Wesson 459 pistol. And so we had a mix of off, or I keep saying officers, we had a mix of agents at this scene uh, that were armed with a variety of weapons. Uh, several of them were armed with their essentially 38 caliber revolvers. They were 357 Magnum revolvers, but shooting 38 caliber ammunition. And then we did have a, a handful of officers or agents that were carrying the 9mm pistols as well. Um, and there was a series of officers that had uh, 12 gauge shotguns in their cars, only one of which were able to uh, get into play in the, in the resulting gunfight, uh, Remington 870 12 gauge shotgun. There were a couple agents that uh, just by happenstance and bad luck that were involved in this rolling stakeout, they were armed with uh, an M16 rifle and an MP5 uh, submachine gun but they were unable to get to the location in time. They were at the far end of the stakeout, and so by the time that they realized that uh, they had located the bad guys and were in pursuit of them, by the time they responded and got to the scene, all the shooting was done. So some of the most potent weapons that the FBI team would have had available to them just never got into play just by virtue of physical distance and, and everything. Now, <clears throat> when the stop happened, how many, op I'm going to say no, officers, how many agents? <laughs> I'm sorry, I led you to it. <laughs> it's okay. How many agents were were with the, the, the TL vehicle? It was, it was a series of, um, of, of, of four cars. Um, you had uh, one car that was driven by um, uh, the... Well, let me back up. So, when the when the suspect vehicle when they made the decision to uh, to terminate the pursuit by ramming them, um, that vehicle was immediately being followed by a car that was filled with the uh, two agents, um, Grogan and Dove, 
and Grogan was the lead case agent for this particular operation. And so they made the call to try to terminate the pursuit. Um, they were immediately followed by a second vehicle uh, containing another two agents, uh, Morales and Hanlon. And there was a third vehicle behind them. It was driven by an agent uh, with the last name of Manowski. Um, when the decision was made to try to terminate the pursuit, um, agent uh, Hanlon and uh, Morales, their vehicle drove up alongside the suspect's vehicle and tried to ram them on the passenger side to drive them off the road towards the right. And uh, in the process of those two cars uh, smashing up against each other and fighting for control over each other, um, it appeared that the passenger suspect was going to take his rifle and shoot uh, across the face of his driver sitting to his left into the vehicle that contained the two agents that were immediately alongside. And so Agent Manowski, seeing that from behind, uh, rammed that suspect vehicle from behind, and the resulting collision sent vehicles in a spray uh, in a bunch of different directions. Um, the pursuit actually wound up um, turning 180 degrees and, and going the opposite direction after the collision of vehicles, and Agent Manowski rammed the car a second time, the suspect's car a second time, and when it was eventually brought to an end, the suspect car was pinned you know, between a vehicle that was parked to its right and Agent Manowski's car, which was parked to its left. And um, shortly thereafter, the supervisor for the squad, um, Agent McNeil, showed up. And so you now had four different vehicles containing two, four, five, six agents that were initially involved in the first part of the stop. Moments later, an additional vehicle would show up with two other uh, FBI agents in it as well, and they would engage from across the street. So you had a lot of agents, uh, a lot of cars, a lot of activity happening in a very, very short period of time here, and a whole lot of chaos with a very dramatic vehicle crash uh, that went off the side of the road and kicked up a whole bunch of dust and that was a big factor for this particular fight because the way that the lighting was at the scene that day and all the dust that was being kicked up, it was a severe restriction to visibility. Uh, there was a large dust cloud that the vehicles eventually terminated in uh, when they crashed, and it restricted the visibility of many of the agents so that they couldn't see where the bad guys were when they were starting to exit their vehicles and so forth. So that was a big player in the way that the fight eventually rolled out. Where, where did they end up crashing? Was it in a populated area or was it? It was oh. in the driveway of a duplex. Um, there was a, uh, a duplex with, uh, with two apartments and it had a, a small little driveway and a parking area where several cars were parked outside of the duplex. And the suspect vehicle crashed into... Uh, a, a hedge of trees and uh, the nose of the vehicle, the nose of the suspect's vehicle came to rest against the base of a tree that was parked at the edge of this driveway and it was wedged between one of the citizen's vehicles on its right and the agent's car on its left when the when the crash terminated. So they, they end up crashing there's that military pause, the dust is starting to settle they come out blazing. Yeah, then all hell breaks loose. So um, the the first shots fired uh, were from the suspects inside the vehicle at Agent Manowski, who had just rammed them off to the side of the road and caused them to crash. His vehicle was immediately alongside the driver's side of the suspect vehicle. So from within the vehicle, the passenger begins to shoot at Agent Manowski with the Mini-14 rifle inside the car. Agent Manowski, in the course of crashing the vehicle, uh, ramming the suspect and crashing the vehicle, has lost his service weapon. Um, he had previously pulled his revolver out of the holster and placed it under his thighs so that it would be immediately accessible to him and that there wouldn't be a delay in getting to it when things stopped. 
Unfortunately, that tactic didn't work well for him, and in the, the force of the collision, he lost his weapon. And so, uh, without a weapon and being under fire from the Mini-14 at close range, uh, the best he could do was bail out of his car and, and flee the immediate area. And in the process of doing that, he was injured by frag from the, the Mini-14 fire. Um, as he was fleeing uh, that vehicle, at that moment is when the, the senior supervisory agent, Gordon McNeil, showed up uh, with his car. And he more or less parked in a, uh, for your viewers to kind of envision it, he kind of like uh, crossed the T, if you will, where the nose of his vehicle was kind of pointed at the side of Agent Manowski's car. And when he exited his vehicle, he moved to the left front fender of Agent Manowski's car, and he began to shoot at the two felons that were still inside the vehicle at this point. And he emptied his, uh, his six-shot revolver through the uh, driver's side uh, window and into the vehicle to try to target the two suspects that were inside the vehicle there. In the process of doing that, um, he got shot in the hand by the Mini-14 and was grievously injured, but uh, managed to uh, fire off the remaining two rounds that he had in his revolver at that time. The problem was that uh, once his weapon was dry, his injured hand made it very, very difficult for him to reload the revolver. And very much like uh, Officer Pence in the Newhall fight, the agents were loading with loose rounds that were carried in, uh, in pouches on their belt. And so McNeil uh, really struggled to try to reload his revolver at that point. Simultaneous to all this, the driver suspect um, fired around from his shotgun towards the rear of his vehicle at agents um, Dove and uh, Grogan, whose, whose FBI car had stopped uh, just right behind them. And Dove and Grogan were starting to fire on the car with their 459 pistols, their Smith and Wesson 459 pistols. They were firing through the rear windshield of that suspect vehicle at the two figures that were inside the vehicle. And as they were shooting at the vehicle, the suspect in the driver's seat was shooting at them to the rear with his, with his shotgun. Um, in the crash that uh, initially kicked off all this stop, agents uh, Morellis and Hanlon wound up crashing into a retaining wall across the street from where the suspect vehicle had, had stopped. And so as all this gunfire is erupting between uh, McNeil and Dove and Grogan and the suspects, um, Morellis and Hanlon are kind of recovering from the effects of the crash and they run across the street to join the fight and um, I've, I probably should stop here to give you a chance to ask a question because I'll just blather on about the narrative for a long time no you're, you're, you're doing fine I'm yeah. following, following it uh, so you had two agents already who was it McNeil and the first guy who got who lost his gun, who, who got the shrapnel. Yeah, so, so Manowski, Manowski, Manowski had lost his gun, and he'd been injured by Frag at this point, and he was out of the fight for the remainder of the fight as he tried to locate a weapon. He thought his weapon had been ejected out of the car into the middle of the street, so he spent the remainder of the fight trying to find his weapon so he can get back into the fight, and it just didn't happen. Uh, McNeil, McNeil has been injured at this point. And then you got two guys running across the street and two guys directly behind the car who are taking fire. All right, so Correct. the guys that are, are, are the, the bad guys still in the car or are they starting to uh, split and uh, flank? At, at, at this point, they are still in the vehicle. Um, as, as Morellis is running across the street from uh, the place where he crashed his car uh, with Agent Hanlon, Morellis has the, the 870 shotgun in his hand, and he's running across the street to reinforce uh, the position of Agents Dove and Grogan that are firing from essentially behind the open doors of their car 
at the vehicle that's parked in front of him, the suspect vehicle that's parked in front of him. He's running across the street to reinforce the position, and he sees that uh, McNeil is, is being injured at this point. And so he changes his course to try to run towards Agent McNeil's position and reinforce the line where it's weakest there at Agent McNeil's position. And in the course of running across the street, he catches a, a couple rounds from the 223 rifle from the Mini-14. Uh, one of those rounds uh, hits him on the uh, the forehead and grazes his forehead and, and cuts a, an artery in his head. But the other one has a more devastating effect. It strikes his arm and it essentially just pulverizes his his arm. It goes through both of the bones and his forearm, and it just turns the whole limb into mush, and it basically, his arm is, is only hanging on below the elbow through just some tissue and, and muscle fragment that's, that's connecting it, but it's just uh, completely destroyed. And, and the strike uh, knocks him to the ground and, and knocks him unconscious. And he's going to come in and out of consciousness for the remainder of the fight. There's going to be moments of, uh, of clarity for him where he's fighting against, um, the overpowering urge to, uh, to go to sleep, uh, because of the shock and the blood loss. Uh, and then there's going to be moments where he's going to be out for a period of time without consciousness of what's going on around him. And he'll revive again and, and, and be in and out throughout the remainder of the fight. So, um, his partner Hanlon has gone to the rear of the vehicle that's parked behind the suspect's vehicle to help reinforce Dove and Grogan, who are engaged still with the felons in the car. And are Dove Hanlon, and Grogan in the car or are they, they are, out of the car? They are, they are firing from the, op- behind the open doors of their FBI vehicle. Okay. The so, non, the non bulletproof open doors. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, they are. They're firing from those positions. Their car stopped. They popped the doors. They got out and started shooting, and they kept their positions there behind the open doors. Uh, so when when Hanlon responds to their vehicle, he goes to the rear bumper of their vehicle uh, to initially seek cover, and uh, he is armed only with a five shot J frame Model Thirty Six revolver. Because like Agent Manowski, he lost his primary weapon in the vehicle crash. Um, his six-shot Smith & Wesson m and revolver was staged underneath his thigh, and he lost it as well uh, in the vehicle crash. And so he pulled his, um, his J-frame backup gun out of an ankle holster, and he ran into what's turning out to be a major gunfight armed with a five-shot uh, J-frame. And he'll come under a lot of um, criticism from folks, you know, years later for losing his primary weapon and so forth. Um, and it's probably worth mentioning that, you know, the two agents did this because it was a matter of habit for them in the prior operations that they had done, which were mostly surveillance operations. You know, when you're, when you're parked in a vehicle for hours at a time and you're monitoring uh, for a bad guy and you think there's a possibility that there might be a a gunfight with that bad guy, Um, you don't want to try to get to your weapon that's carried strong side and a pancake holster underneath the jacket and perhaps with a seat belt or something like that in the way. You don't want to have to clear through all that clothing and try to get the weapon out and so forth in a hurry. So it was very common for the FBI agents when they're doing surveillance operations for them to stage their weapon underneath their thigh like that, take it out of the holster so that they could get to it very quickly if things popped off really quick. And so it was their habit to do that, and that was an appropriate tactic to do in certain circumstances. Unfortunately, it was not an appropriate tactic for a vehicle chase that had the potential to wind up terminating a crash. And so both those agents lost their weapons as a result of, of making that choice of staging them underneath their leg and uh, losing them in the crash. So both uh, bad guys are still in the car. When do they exit the vehicle? At some point during this, the the um, the passenger with the Mini 14 exits out through the uh, the passenger side window of his vehicle and 
it's a little difficult to describe without the graphic, but if you can imagine his vehicle um, comes to a rest immediately adjacent to another vehicle that's, that's parked to his right, and the distance is so close that he can't open the door of his vehicle and get out. So the only way that he's able to get out of his vehicle, the suspect is able to crawl through the passenger side window and across the hood of the car that's parked immediately to his right. And when he crawls across that hood, he winds up at the right front fender of the vehicle that's parked immediately to his right. And he, he gets out of the vehicle with the Mini 14, and at that point, he becomes mobile. The problem is, is that um, many of the agents on the scene were not able to see that he had exited the vehicle at that point. Several of them didn't know that he was outside of the vehicle because of the angles involved and intervening obstacles, the dust, the angle of the sunlight, uh, a combination of factors. Many of the agents on the scene didn't know where that bad guy was. One agent who did know where he was was Agent Jerry Dove. And Dove was positioned there at the right front of the FBI car that was immediately behind the suspect vehicle. And when the suspect bailed out of his, uh, his car, crawling through the passenger side window and across the hood of the vehicle next to him, Agent Dove had a very, very brief window of time where he was able to see the suspect fire at him. And when he fired at him, he actually landed several hits on the suspect, including the one hit that the Miami gunfight is, is going to, you know, be most well known for, which was a, a, a round from a nine millimeter that penetrated through the suspect's right upper arm, entered his, his right chest, and it tracked across his chest towards the heart, and it stopped just short of the heart. When that bullet traveled through the suspect's right upper arm, it ruptured an artery that caused uh, massive bleeding. And he also had massive internal bleeding from the track of the bullet as it raced across his, his upper chest towards the heart. But unfortunately, the bullet ran out of energy before it reached the heart. It stopped just short of it, and it didn't destroy the heart. And so even though our suspect at this point was grievously wounded and it would eventually bleed out and die from his wounds, he still had several minutes where he was functional and operational and able to continue to fight uh, just because of pure adrenaline and, uh, and will to survive. And so um, when he became mobile on the other side of that vehicle with the Mini-14, uh, he went on a rampage uh, with that Mini-14 charging the FBI agent's position at the car that was parked right behind him. And to kind of short-circuit the story, in the process of him uh, taking the fight to the enemy, if you will, he wound up uh, shooting and killing um, Agent Dove. He wound up shooting and grievously wounding Agent Hanlon, who had emptied his five-shot revolver by this time. And he also wound up shooting and killing Agent um, uh, Grogan at the, uh, the left front of the FBI vehicle as well. And unfortunately, because of, again, shadows, intervening obstacles, distances, the angles, and so forth, other agents that were on the scene couldn't see all of those events very clearly. Uh, I had mentioned that there was another vehicle of two agents that showed up late in the fight, um, Agents Reisner and Arantia, and those two agents were parked across the street and monitoring this fight from a distance of perhaps uh, 25 yards or so. But because of the mix of vehicles and obstacles and the angles and the dust and everything, they really couldn't see these events happen clearly when the suspect with the Mini-14 was killing the FBI agents. Uh, they would get brief glimpses at him, and they would fire rounds at him uh, when they had the opportunity, but they couldn't track his actions with uh, fidelity. They didn't know exactly where he was at all times. They couldn't get clear angles of fire on him at all times. So they would fire at him when they could, but they weren't able to track his, his actions all the time. 
Um, and so at this point in the fight, we have Agent Manowski out of the fight trying to find a weapon that he can't find. We have Agent McNeil, who's been grievously wounded in the hand, who can no longer reload his revolver. We have Agents Dove, uh, Grogan, and Hanlon that are down and out of the fight. Dove and Grogan killed, Hanlon grievously wounded. And Morellis is down on the ground, uh, grievously wounded as well, fighting to keep. Okay. Uh, take two. All miracle right. of uh, technology. Miracle of technology. Uh, that's interesting. That's, I don't know. There was a glitch in the system, glitch in the matrix. All right. So you have, uh, just as a recap, you have uh, Morales is is injured. You have two other agents who are, are down and, and dead. Uh, you have one guy, uh, I want to say McCluskey, but McCluskey. <laughs> yeah, McNeil. McNeil. Yeah. McNeil. He he doesn't have his gun. He's oh, injured. Okay, no, Manowski. Manowski Manowski doesn't have the gun. He's out of the fight. A lot of M's. McNeil is injured in the hand. And, and Morales is injured in the head. And okay. uh and you have two uh two down officers, agents. Right. And uh bad guy with the M fourteen, he's taking one through the chest. Uh he's dead, he just doesn't know it yet. That's right. And the other guy, what's he doing? Other bad guy. That's that's a bit of the mystery of the fight, and um, I uh, I've done some research about that, and I uh, have some ideas of what happened that I'm not ready to discuss right now. But uh, the the mystery of the fight is how the first suspect who's in the driver's seat of the suspect vehicle gets from that spot to the FBI car, because what happens at uh, this stage of the fight, the two suspects have. Uh, managed to injure multiple FBI agents and kill two, and they are now going to try to make their getaway in the FBI car that was parked directly behind them. And so the suspect with the Mini-14 winds up behind the the driver's uh, side of the FBI car, and the suspect who was initially the driver in the suspect car is now in the passenger seat of the FBI car. And they're going to attempt to try to start that vehicle and drive away. Um, the problem for both of these two suspects at this point is that they're both shot up pretty bad. Each of them has been um, uh, injured very badly. And so a lot of their body parts aren't working very well. So there's a bit of a struggle between the two of them. They have to work collectively to try to get the car started and in gear to drive it away. And as they're struggling with trying to do that, Agent Morellis realizes that they are going to try to make a getaway and he has pretty much at this point determined that uh, he's told himself that he's not going to survive the incident but he's going to make it his final act to stop these two suspects and so he's going to fire at them first with his Remington 870 shotgun uh, remember that he only has one operable arm at this point. Uh, the other arm has been rendered completely useless. It's just hanging limp by his side. So he very creatively uh, comes up with a way to work his 870 shotgun, pump shotgun with one hand, and he fires the four rounds in that shotgun, uh, essentially to very little effect um, at the two suspects. Uh, causes minor injuries to one of them, but doesn't have the effect that he would like and when he sees that they're continuing to try to drive away, he decides that he is going to get up from his position of cover and he's going to simply charge the FBI vehicle on the driver's side and he's going to shoot both of the suspects through the driver's side window with his, uh, with his revolver. And he does that. He, he gets up in one final uh, gasp of energy uh, walks the distance firing with uh, his one good hand and winds up killing both the driver and the suspect as they sit inside the FBI vehicle before they can drive away and when he fires his last shot he simply collapses at the side of the FBI vehicle and at that point everybody on scene uh, as they're as this whole shooting has continued, there have become uh, a greater crowd of officers and agents there. 
Um, agents are arriving from the stakeout location. You've also got uh, Metro Dade officers that are arriving that have been called by citizens that are reporting this gunfight. And so the collection of uniformed police officers and plainclothes FBI agents swarm the, 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 the FBI vehicle at this point after Morales kills the two of them. And, uh, and they essentially secure the scene and start, start tending to the wounded agents. So how many agents died in total? Two agents died. Um, agents Grogan and Dove uh, were both uh, both murdered by uh, the suspects. Um, Agent Hanlon was very grievously injured. Agent Morales was very grievous, grievously injured. Agent McNeil was very grievously injured. Uh, Agent Arantia had uh, some minor frag injury. Uh, Agent Manowski had some minor frag injury. And the only involved agent that didn't get um, any any scratches on him was uh, Agent Reisner, uh, who was w- with Agent Arantia, was one of the two agents that fired on the position from across the street. So because of this, the FBI went to a, they, they gave up on the 9mm, and they went to the 40 Smith & Wesson, which was in law enforcement for a long time, <laughs> until now yeah. the FBI puts out that they're going back to nine millimeter and everyone's back at nine millimeter now. So we talked about after the Newhall shooting that there was um, a great rush to try to blame a lot of the problems on the equipment and to make uh, the, the equipment the boogeyman and to try to rectify the problems by changing the equipment. And the FBI as an agency was very much in the same position following this fight. This, this was one of the worst moments in their history and they were desperate to try to figure out um, a way to recover from it. And so one of the issues in the fight, like we talked about, was a a nine millimeter bullet that failed to penetrate the suspect and go all the way to his heart. And that's something that certain elements within the FBI really focused on. And the narrative that the FBI began to tell themselves and the greater public was that if that ammunition had done a better job, that the fight would have ended right there and that they wouldn't have lost their agents. And, uh, you know, that's, that's possibly correct. Um, but um, it ignored some of the larger issues about um, training and tactics and so forth that uh, are important with the Miami fight. But the Miami fight will forever be known for the failure of this particular bullet to penetrate all the way to the suspect's heart. And so the FBI... Um, took on a project of trying to develop a way to evaluate police ammunition to get ammunition that would uh, perform to their desired requirements. And because this bullet didn't penetrate deeply enough in the fight, the primary thing that the FBI was concerned about was finding police ammunition that would penetrate deep. And so that led them to the 147 grain uh, 9mm round that they adopted as standard. And in the meantime, as they continued to field the 147 grain 9 millimeter Winchester OSM round, they developed a more extensive testing protocol for law enforcement ammunition that eventually led them in the direction of a reduced um, loading of the 10 millimeter auto. And so several years after the Miami incident, uh, the FBI had the, what we now know is their uh, ballistic testing protocol that involves 10% calibrated gelatin that's shot with a variety of barriers in front of it, auto glass, uh, drywall, plywood, um, sheet metal representing car steel, uh, heavy clothing, bare gelatin. And um, they did a very extensive test of uh, available ammunition at the time and determined through the course of of their testing that they would issue a a 180 grain 10 millimeter auto uh, round to their to their agents that was downloaded from the original velocity of the 10 millimeter to provide about 950 to 980 feet per second out of the the autos that they chose to issue and that reduced recoil fbi light as it was uh, uh often teased and called, uh, that reduced recoil 10 millimeter round served the FBI for a period of years until Smith & Wesson developed the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge in 1990. 
which duplicated the ballistics of that reduced recoil 10 millimeter round, but it was able to be fired in weapons that were the size of a nine millimeter instead of weapons that are the size of a 45 or 10 millimeter frame. And so at that point, the FBI kind of followed the rest of law enforcement into issuing uh, 40 caliber weapons for their troops for a period of time. Uh, and so that 40 Smith and Wesson round did, did very well for the FBI as well as for uh, law enforcement agencies across the United States. Um, we're, there really weren't a lot of issues with its performance, with its terminal performance, but because it is a high energy round um, and because of the demographics uh, that result in law enforcement hiring, uh, and we found that uh, there were some officers, some agents that um, encountered greater difficulties shooting 40 caliber pistols. And so the decision was made to um, start looking at other alternatives. And by this time, by courtesy of the FBI protocol and increased emphasis by ammunition manufacturers on coming up with uh, more sophisticated bullet designs, the 9mm cartridge that the FBI had initially issued uh, is now uh, a cartridge that they thought was viable for, for use as a, as a duty round. And so because the cartridge uh, recoils less than the 40 caliber and uh, they could uh, have a greater magazine capacity and because they felt that they weren't giving up anything in the way of terminal ballistics, the FBI is now back to issuing 9mm pistols today. And that's kind of the darling round of law enforcement. You know, everybody is kind of starting to dump their 40 caliber guns and, and issue nine millimeters again. So you don't think it's uh, uh, it's not the, the arrow, it's the archer. Uh, is that the lesson that we can learn from the uh, shootout? I, I think, uh, you know, there are a host of lessons and I'm, I'm actively trying to write about them and put them into book format so I could share my opinions on it. But um, I think that we limit ourselves by typecasting Miami as a gunfight where ammunition was the significant factor, was the prime factor. Um, if we only want to focus at the performance of a single nine millimeter silver tip bullet we lose out on a lot of other very important lessons about mindset and tactics and procedures and so forth. Um, honestly, some of the most important lessons of Miami are the ones that we never talk about. There was some extraordinary courage and extraordinary uh, mental preparedness and awareness issues um, with the FBI agents involved. You know, we spoke about uh, Agent uh, Hanlon. Um, the guy lost his primary weapon and plunged headlong into a rifle gunfight armed with a five-shot J-frame because he didn't his fellow agents to be unsupported. He wanted to help them out. Uh, tremendous courage, tremendous fighting mindset and aggressiveness there. Uh, fighting spirit like, you know, we rarely see. And... To me, it's a shame that we don't focus on the positive lessons of something like that because we're so overly focused on figuring out how many angels can dance on the head of a nine millimeter bullet, you know. Um, honestly, if Agent Dove had been armed with the 10 millimeter pistol that the FBI eventually wound up issuing after the fight, there's a 50-50 chance that it may not have made any difference because he may have wound up running out of ammunition before he ever got a chance to fire the shot that hit the suspect as he crawled out of the vehicle. Because Agent Dove expended two magazines worth of ammunition in his 9mm pistol, and he was on the tail end of his second uh, magazine when he was finally able to land that shot on the suspect as he climbed out of the car. So if he'd have had his 10 millimeter or the 45 or whatever gun that somebody wanted him to be able to have at that moment in time, it's likely that he would have been already out of ammunition by the time that the suspect crawled out of the car and he would have never had the opportunity to make that shot. So we can talk about calibers and so forth and bullet performance until we're blue in the face, but I think that um, 
one of the things that Miami shows us, if we're paying attention, is that it's damn difficult to kill somebody that doesn't want to be killed. And people can take horrendous damage and continue fighting if they have the will and the spirit to do so. And unfortunately for us, unfortunately for the good guys in this case, they met somebody that had a tremendous will to live, a tremendous fighting spirit. And he was on the wrong side of this fight, unfortunately for us. But, you know, this guy, like you said earlier, was a dead man walking. He was dead, but he just didn't know it yet. But he had things that he wanted to do before he finally laid down. And we can say that a different bullet might have done a better job of putting him down. And that's something that we really can't say for sure, because there's so many variables involved with these things. What we do know is that he took tremendous damage. He took a hit that most people would have died from and most people would have stopped from, right? But he chose to continue fighting. And so there are significant tactical lessons about that for us where we can't become so focused on ammunition. We need to start thinking about other things, you know, tactics, training, mindset. What happens when what we're doing isn't working? How do we recover from that? Do we have a plan B? Do we have a plan C? Uh, do we have other ways to deal with this problem when we shoot the bad guy and he doesn't go down? Uh, so those are some of the issues I think that are perhaps more important for us to talk about Miami rather than trying to, you know, talk about uh, um, bullet weights, velocities, grains, penetration distances, and temporary cavities in gel and all these other types of things. Um, there is a place for the equipment, you know. Um, we all know that having the right equipment makes a very, very important difference in your ability to get the job done. And, and I, won't, I won't argue that. But in the big scheme of things, I think that what you carry is a whole lot less important than the decisions that you're making, your awareness, your ability to react to stress, your ability to react to change, your ability to adjust your tactics and your approach when things aren't working, uh, the types of tactics that we use, the way that we communicate with our team members, all those things, I think, uh, the skill with which we use our equipment, I think all of those things are much more important than the actual equipment that we carry. Bef you know, that that's going to be a great book. And uh, we're all going to be looking forward to reading it. Um, so be sure and finish it quickly. And um, <laughs> and I want to tell everybody before we let Mike go is, uh, you know, please subscribe to uh, this YouTube channel or podcast, however you are, if you're watching this or if you're listening to it on audio, because uh, the more people that we get who are involved in this, the more it's easier for me to to bring on guests uh, such as Mike and some of the other people. Uh, so, Mike, thank you so much. Again, I want you to get out there and, and finish typing up this book because there's so many <laughs> lessons that we can learn from it. And, you know, like I said, I, 20 years in law enforcement, when I first got on, it was cultural within the police department to go over and talk about a lot of these incidents, especially within our own department, you know, different shit. If I talk to these new kids today, they have no clue, no yeah. clue on on some of these major incidents, uh, unless they see it in uh, a TikTok video or in uh, a movie. Uh, maybe yeah. they'll see it in this podcast. But anyways, Mike, thank you so much for, it's been over a year since you've been on the show. So thank you again for coming on the show and uh, sharing your, uh, your history and your lessons uh, to the Firearms Nation. Well, it's always my honor to do it. I'm always happy to come back. Uh, I apologize. We've had some uh, problems getting me scheduled to match your calendar and everything, but I'm very glad that we were finally able to make it work out. I look forward to coming back again and talking to you about the book when it's finished. Uh, in the meantime, if guys are interested in, in hearing more of what I have to say about various things, they could find me at revolverguide.com. Uh, we've actually got a couple articles that will be coming up later this year that I just put the final touches on that will be debriefs of other officer-involved shootings that were notable um, in the transition from revolvers to automatics. And so I think guys will find some interesting things there. So uh, if you want to see more of me, that's where you can find me for now, revolverguy.com. And 
I'll try to uh, do a better job of balancing life, work, and revolver guy and try to get this book finished for your audience there. Sounds great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Be, be safe, everybody.